Ladies and gentlemen, Miles yeah. of Fastball! Yeah, hell yeah. I gotta intro you properly. Dude, thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? Good. How are you? We are doing fantastic. fantastic. Danny Good. worked really, really hard on putting this together. I know she has a ton of questions for you. I have a couple as well. Okay. The first question I want to ask you, Miles, is uh, could you please uh, properly introduce yourself, let us know where in the bouts of the world you are right now, and plug or promote oh. anything that you'd like, sir? Um. Well, I'm Miles Zuniga from Fastball. I'm in Austin, Texas, and I guess I would promote – I do a Tuesday – Tuesdays with Miles on Facebook. If you go to my Facebook page, you can watch it there, or you can watch it on Fastball's YouTube channel. I do it every Tuesday at seven, except sometimes, like next week, I'm doing a private show, so there's no show. Um, well, you, there's still one ticket left for the private show. Um, <laughs> but uh, that would be, for most of your listeners, that's probably the, where the easiest way to find me or, or see me play. We are doing a show. Fastball's doing a show in Austin on the 4th of March. Um, and then we're playing a show in Tampa, and there's, you know, there's dates and stuff around. But but uh, that's the main thing I would want to promote. The other thing is a Patreon. Fastball has a Patreon. And so we put out a new song every month. But actually, if you join now, we've already put out, I don't know how many songs, five or six. So you would get all those five or six for five bucks. So it's a pretty yeah. good deal. That's awesome. The the I guess the initial first question I want to ask you is what does it feel like? What did it feel like the minute you guys were you found out you were nominated for two Grammys a while back? What what did that feel like? That's got to be amazing just as an artist who has worked so hard on your craft to get that recognition. I mean, that was pretty exciting, but it was coming after a year or two of really exciting things happening. So it was just one more kind of exciting thing. When I found out that we were nominated for a Grammy, I was actually in Barbados. So <laughs> and like two years before that, I was sleeping in my friend's basement and, and driving a car that kept breaking down. So it was, that it was, was, it was quite a dramatic shift. That was my, my first question is, um, you know, you guys, when you released uh, All the Pain Money Can Buy, you all still had day jobs. Tony was working at like a bagel factory yeah. overnight. He and was. then six months later, you guys are, are on the late show and just like uh, top of the charts. How, how did you guys handle that? Like, what was that like? I mean, it was great. It was, it was, it, to me, it wasn't hard to handle. <laughs> uh, the hard part is after all that stuff's over and done with, that's the hard part to handle, you know? Right. Uh, because you spend your life trying to get to this place and then you get there and but it's just so everything just moves so fast and you know you don't know how long you're going to be able to maintain you have to keep if you're a radio band that has hits then you got to keep having hits. you have to keep having radio band hits yeah if you're that kind of band, if you're a band like Slayer, then no. You, you can, <laughs> then you can just do whatever the hell you, you want. Well, you can be Slayer and and be really good at being Slayer. You know, eventually though, we were able to build build up a really good audience just playing live and stuff after the fact, but it took a while. Yeah. So it wasn't overnight, and the success seemed like it was overnight, but it wasn't. We had put in a lot of time as a band, and we put in a lot of time individually as musicians as well so yeah it took a lot it took a long time to get there and then when the whole you know the kind of champagne buzz of having hits and all that dissipates um you have to learn how to survive you have to learn how to deal you know i, I would say I, I would imagine it would be like relearning to be quote unquote normal again yeah i guess that's one way you could put it it's more like there's a few years there where everybody just wants to laugh, you know, wants to kick kick you while you're down. It's kind of, I don't know why people are like that, but 
but there's definitely a period where, oh yeah, you you know, you're a one hit wonder. Or you used to be on the radio, but you're, you know, there's a there's this weird phase that all the everybody that has a hit song, if you don't have, if you're not Elton John, you're gonna go right. through this phase. Um, but then, then something else happens. If you stick around long enough, then people start going, oh man, you're you're a survivor. You're a badass. You're like. You're a true artist. You've been around a long time, so it's it's funny. It's just people's perception. Yeah, it's. You know? I, I'm sure it's it's quite a trip. <laughs> it, <laughs> it is. It it it's strange. Uh, I try not to take any of that too seriously. Um, when people tell me or my band that we're great, I don't really pay attention. When they say we suck, I don't really pay attention. You just try to do the best that you can do, and that's, that's that. Fun. Yeah, that's a really great, great attitude to have. Yeah. What would you say is the is the best advice you were ever given from somebody in the music industry? Hmm. That's a really good question. And I don't know if anyone's ever given me any good advice. Uh, <laughs> I mean, one, one, one piece of advice that I really liked was we had this producer when uh, I was in this band, Big Car, and we were talking about Frank Sinatra and just how amazing he was and how he could come in and just sing a whole record from top to bottom in a day um, sometimes. You know, he's just a fantastic singer. And the producer, I just remember, he goes, this guy might be able to do it in a day. This guy over here, he might have to do 50 takes of the song I don't care as long as the end result is great. That's all that matters. And I thought that was good advice. Like, like some people are really gifted. Other people are not as gifted, but in the end, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. What matters is what you do with your gift. You know, you can be, uh, you know, you can be Paul McCartney or you could be Scott Wheeland, you know, the choice is up to you. Like, like, uh, obviously, it's sad what happened to Scott Whelan, you know, but like some people get, some people either, you know, they have personal problems and stuff they can't overcome. Other people just are lazy. You know, there's, there's all these different ways you can go. Really, you're, you're accountable to yourself. You don't really have to answer to anyone but yourself. And so it's when you look in the mirror, do you, do you like what you see? It's pretty much what it is. What would you say is the worst gig story? What's the worst gig story you could give me? Like where a night where just everything went wrong and uh, <laughs> y you couldn't hear uh, the sound, the guitar was tuned incorrectly and you didn't realize it. Give me the worst gig story you could think of. I mean, well, I have a, I have a really good one that, that's just me when I was uh, playing the solo gig. I had a solo gig up in Dallas. It's about like a three hour drive. And, you know, this is when I was like 26 and I was changing the strings on my guitar and then I had to go to the show. Dallas is about a three hour drive. I was supposed to play at seven and I left my house at about 3.45. <laughs> like it's the most unprofessional shit ever. You know, it's like I, I left myself no time if something went wrong, I've left myself no time to stop and get something to eat or go to use the restroom. No time if I got lost. I basically left myself a 15 minute window to get there and then set up and play. And so on the way, uh, this woman had was driving behind this truck and this truck had a some sort of crane or something over the top of it. And it was too high for the overpass and it hit the overpass oh, and no. broke the overpass and the overpass fell and crushed this poor woman and oh, she no. died she died <laughs> oh and my the goodness tra the tra traffic was backed up on i-35 for miles and miles and miles it was like you couldn't move so now i'm stuck in traffic but i was able to get off and use the you know use the uh on-ramp what are you called that the, the my brain is fogging over the lane, you know, the little access road. Yeah. The frontage road. Frontage road. I was able to use the frontage road to go along the highway for a bit. Then that ended and I had to cross the highway somehow on a little bridge and then go through another. 
go through a neighborhood, cut through a mall. Like and this is before cell phones or anything. I was just trying to figure it out. And I somehow figured my way back onto the highway past where the accident had happened. And also there were no cell phones. You don't know what time, you don't know why, what the deal was with the traffic. But I got, I saw the accident and I, I was able to continue on and, and the highway was wide open. Anyways, long story short, I got there at like, I must've gotten there at six, six fifty three, and the gigs, <laughs> gigs at seven is super nice. Uh, uh, it was a grand opening of this club and there were a lot of swanky looking Dallas people in there. And I, my hair was like matted to my head because I had no air conditioning in the car and I was <laughs> huge sweat stained down my back. And I, I came in and I set up and people weren't really paying attention. It was the only saving grace. It was one of those type of gigs where no one's really, no one, I'm just background music. And I took out my guitar and there's a nut, the thing you call the nut, which is by the tuning pegs that mm -hmm. the strings go over. That had slipped out while I was putting on my strings. Oh no. So that was laying on the floor of my bedroom. So there was no way to get actual, it was hard to get sound out of the guitar. Because yeah, no. So it was, the strings were just flat against the thing. And I just, I just faked my way through this like two, <laughs> two hour show. A two hour such... show like that? Well, I had, <laughs> it was two set, it was two 45 minute sets with the break in between. And oh, like, any, if anyone had really been paying attention, uh, they wouldn't have paid me. Like, you couldn't, <laughs> you couldn't really hear. It, it just sounded like dirt, you know, and you couldn't really hear. But um, luckily for me, I was just wallpaper. No one was really paying attention. And um, actually, that I was one of the bands. They had like six or seven different performers. It was an all day. It started like three and went till midnight or two in the morning i can't remember so i came on around seven and went till nine and uh it was two nights and then the lady came up to me and goes um well the people that organize this thing said they just want one night of music and i thought it was because me but she goes but don't worry i told them they had to pay you for both nights so i got paid for both nights. oh hell yeah let's go <laughs> and I, I, only, I only had to pay I only had to play one night and I, it, it was really embarrassing. So that was like one really. Um, it worked out well in the end. It worked out well in the end though. You got paid. That one worked out well. Um, I mean, then there was another time where fastball had a gig. Oh God, where were we? We were somewhere near Memphis. We were like in this weird little, in the middle of nowhere, this, this super rich kid had hired us to come play his party. And uh, this was like when our song was all over the radio and it cost a lot of money and he paid to have us come. He had this little quote unquote festival and uh, <laughs> he picked us up in a limousine and, and our road manager said, this guy just likes to hang out with rock stars. And I've never considered myself like a rock star, but I figured if he's paying this much, I don't want to disappoint him. So I'm going to pretend like I'm, <laughs> A rock star. So he picked us up and I said, oh, can we go to the liquor store? That's the first thing I want to do. And he goes, no problem. So we go in the limousine over to the liquor store and like me and Tony start picking out like $150 bottles of wine and like tequila. And we're like, let's do some Motley Crue type shit and see what this guy does. You know, we're just going to load this thing with booze and, and uh, run up a huge tab. And I was just waiting for him to go, no, hey, hey, hey calm down. I can't you know, afford this. The guy didn't bat an eye, right? We, so we, we probably spent 1200 bucks on, on food. Whoa, and he just wow. Put down, he just put down his credit card and then we got in the limo and went and kept on going. And he lived pretty far away. You know, we, we had flown into Memphis and he lived out in the country somewhere. And he was having this festival at his house. And um, we were supposed to go on, I think at 11 p.m. But the festival, quote unquote, festival was so disorganized that we didn't end up going on until like one in the morning. Wow. In the interim, we had gotten into the wine. You know, we went to <laughs> we went to dinner and had wine there, and then we had some more wine, and then and then we started drinking. I started drinking tequila. <laughs> and uh we was like, I was making these margaritas, and we had this guitar player in the band who was 
younger than me and like really liked to party. And <laughs> he told me, he goes, you, hey man, you better slow down. I said, what? And I was like, why is Andy telling me to slow down? <laughs> he's the one. He's the one that needs to slow down. And I reached for the bottle and the bottle was like empty. It just popped up in my hand. And I went, holy cow. We, we've already gone through this whole bottle of tequila. So, but I felt fine. Uh, and then I went looking, trying to find a restroom and I couldn't find one. And I opened the door and it was this bedroom and there's a bed. And I just went, oh man, it's been a long day. It'd be so nice to just lay down for just a minute. And I laid down and my drummer, our drummer Joey woke me up and said, hey man, it's time to go. And I go, oh, good. Thank God that's over. Let's go back to the, I can't wait to go back to the hotel. I go, no, we got to play. <laughs> we got to go on. <laughs> and I said, we had, I'm like, wait a minute, we haven't played yet? And he goes, no, we haven't. And I sat up in the bed and the, the, the bed was just spinning, like violently spinning. <laughs> but I was like completely drunk. And I couldn't even, I could barely stand. Uh, uh, they're paying us a lot of money. So the road manager just going to shove me out there. And uh, I was like, that was a long show. Like I could barely stand up. I couldn't remember where we were in the songs. It was like sit on the drum riser half the time. It was really awful. <laughs> uh, so there's got to be footage out was, there. Or was this, was this in the cell phone days? Or this was not then. So people were... were was, was this was it, this when is this cell like phone. every everyone have the cell phones out or no? thank god thank god all this stuff <laughs> happened pre-cell phone you, the world we're living in now is insane and i it's really completely am completely different i am so glad i'm the age i'm at now i wouldn't want to be 22 or 23 although i guess people that are 22 or 23 don't know any different right but, but we had such a good time uh, both in that band and every band I was in, I've had so much fun and none of it was documented. There's no embarrassing. There's no proof. <laughs> there's no proof and there's no embarrassing <laughs> moments of like anyone to laugh at you. There were so many times where you're like, oh my God, I'm glad I'm not running for Congress or something. This would torpedo that. Although this day, not in this day and age, it wouldn't matter. But but like um, just so many embarrassing, stupid things. <laughs> and and then you, but, but yeah, no one, no one made a movie of it. No one put it up on the internet. There's, you know, it's just out. It's just the past. Now everything, literally everything is documented. If we, if we do a show I, nine times out of 10, I don't have to go like, I wish we'd recorded it. I just go on YouTube and find it. Right. So cool. it's, it's really weird. At, at the peak of fastball's fame, where where was your favorite place to play on tour? Like, was there is there a particular show that you recall being th these fans just went absolutely bonkers, more crazy than than the normal show? Like one show that stands out as something that you'll never forget. Um, I mean, it's hard to say. Really, uh, we always had great time in Chicago. We always had a really good crowd there. Um, one time we opened for Everclear on this tour and it was this i think it was a free show out in the park in canada and that was the biggest crowd i think i've ever played to i think there was thirty thousand people out there oh my goodness so that was that was amazing but um this wasn't at the peak this was just a couple of years ago but we went to spain and played man we had a couple of shows there that were some of my favorite of all time there was one in this little tiny shotgun shack of a bar it was on the little cobblestone street. The bar probably held a hundred people maybe. And uh, it was a super cool little vibey place, but it was a Sunday and we're in a tiny town. And I was thinking like, who booked this gig, man? No one is gonna be here. We're gonna be playing for the bartender. We're not that big in Spain. Like we're gonna be playing for the bartender and, and a couple of his friends. And I'll be darned, man, right, you know, showtime was at seven or eight. And right around 6.15, people started rolling in. And by 7 o'clock, the place was ram-packed. And it was nice. the, they were so stoked. And the stage was so tiny, and they were right in our face. And it was, like, incredible. And then the, we did another show. The last show we did in Spain was in Valencia, I think. And those people were bananas. They, they <laughs> knew every word. They were, like, it was, that was also an incredible gig. So it just kind of depends but there was a lot of them back then i just can't remember it's so long ago 
Uh, Danny, I know you have a couple more for sure. Can you show What's them? Can you show your... them really quick the uh, the vinyl that's missing a oh. signature? Yeah, oh. I have I have Miles and I have Tony, but I don't have Joey. Did you order that from us, or how did how did you get that? Uh, my husband got it uh, for Christmas for me, um, and it's I, got actually it's got Miles and Tony, but no Joey. I don't know how that happened, but. Um... <laughs> I, I, yeah, I can't really explain that. Um, we're not together all the time, though, so maybe I figured that he was, was busy that day, or or. Well, maybe happened. he wasn't. Maybe we signed it. Uh, sometimes Tony and I just do shows by ourselves. I don't know. Did he get it at a show, or did he get it? No, I think he ordered it online. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how that slipped through the cracks. I don't know I'm either. Sorry, sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, Danny, what other questions um, did you have though? I'm sorry. Yeah. What's the, uh, what's your favorite album that you've done? I mean, obviously all the pain money can buy was the one that skyrocketed you guys, but what's your personal favorite one that fastball has done? I really like keep your wig on. I don't know why. I just think it's got a certain energy to it. That's, that's really magical. And that was the first record. I think that, that started us. I think of our career kind of in two halves and the first half was trying to get on the radio, trying to have hit songs, all that stuff. And then the second half was like, well, that's over and done with. <laughs> what are we going to do now? And, <laughs> and sort of starting out on that road was that record, Keep Your Wig On, which it was on Ryko Disc, I guess. But I say that yeah. one was a new label, right? Yeah, exactly. So we'd done three records on Hollywood. And the budget was the budget for each record kept getting bigger and bigger. So a lot of our fans really love um, the harsh light of day, but to me that record is just a loaded mess. You know, <laughs> to me it's just like it has too many guest stars, and it's it. We spent an for us an eternity working on it. I mean, it wasn't that long, but it it seemed like we. Uh, it just seemed like we spent a lot of time on it and it just seems kind of grandiose and I don't think it really merits the grandiosity. Um, so it's not really my favorite. Um, and I kind of left me with a bad taste in my mouth. So then it was nice to strip it down again, keep your wig on. And we also had uh, a couple of our friends play on the record. So this guy, Jeff Groves, who was in big car with me and Joey, yeah. um, plays on the record and and um, sings on the record a little bit. And and then this guy, Kevin McKinney, who has played with Tony in this band, Renfro, and he's, he's a good friend of ours. He also came down and played. And so it, was, it made it more, um, there's a video or there's an EPK of us, of that record. And you can kind of catch the vibe from the EPK of what, what it was like and it was it was just real fun uh it was it was fun record to make and i still some of my favorite tunes are still on that record is there yeah, that one was really fun and my my second favorite um is uh step into light yeah that's a nice one too so that both those records are kind of like new new beginnings because we did keep your wig on and then i guess we did Correct me if I'm wrong. We did Little White Lies. Is that right? I think is so. The, is that the next one? Yeah. So, so Little White Lies kind of came at, uh, it really, after that record, it really felt like the band might just implode. Like, like <laughs> it felt like, it kind of felt like, wow, we're not getting anywhere. Nobody really wants to hear us. And uh, we kind of were, yeah, we kind of, I mean, there was a long, long break between Little White Lies and Step in the Light. And the reason yes. is, the reason is we weren't really having any fun. We weren't really getting along and no one seemed to care anyway. So, so it was kind of like, well, why are we doing this? And so we, we never really officially broke up or anything. We no. still did some shows and stuff, but we just kind of, it was on a definitely back burner time for fastball at that point. And, and, it didn't really pick up again until, mm, I want to say 2013. So it was like two or three years of nothing. And then we 
we went on a tour with all these bands like Sugar Ray and Jim Blossoms. And that kind of gave us a kick in the pants. And then we, we kind of got back on the horse. And, and then we found that we were getting along a lot better and the climate just seemed to be different. <laughs> it just, it's weird, but it's kind of like if you try to force things, it never, ever works. No. You kind of have to go with the flow. And if the universe is saying, right now, this part of your life or this thing that you want to do just isn't going to work, you can try and push the rock uphill. But I found it's better to try to reassess and maybe maybe there's another thing that's coming really easy to you you should probably do that for a while is there is there an engineer or producer that you've idolized for a while that you just have not had the opportunity to work with but it's still on your bucket list of i want to just do some form of music with this particular producer or engineer just hasn't worked out yet um well probably most of the time you just can't afford them or they're they're too they're so big that they're not, you know, you've got to have a lot of money and, 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 you know, they're unavailable. There's, there's probably, there's so many that I, I, I love. I mean, I love Mitchell Froom, um, who did the crowded house stuff. Uh, I really like, you know, I, just to say I worked with him. I'd like to work with Rick Rubin. I don't, I've heard stories. I've heard some stories from some people that are like, oh my God, he doesn't even show up. And I, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm sure he shows up for the Chili Peppers, but, I, <laughs> but you know, I've heard from some artists that work with him that he just wasn't even there. And um, same thing with, you know, there's just different producers you hear these stories, but they keep, they keep making huge hit albums and winning awards, so... Uh, someone must be doing something. Uh, so I don't know. It'd be it'd be interesting to it'd be interesting to see. It'd be interesting to see what his deal is. Um, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of. I would love to try. I mean, it'd be really strange, but I'd love to try to work with Mutt Lang because he made Back in Black and he made Highway to Hell. You know, he also did those Shania Twain records with. Yes, because she married him. <laughs> yeah, but uh, I, he, you know, he has been behind the board on some of my favorite records, so that would be interesting. Yeah. Nile Rodgers would be great. Oh yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. I mean, I haven't really. Every time I do an interview, I remember all this stuff after the interview's over. Like, why, <laughs> yeah. Why did, why didn't you say that? You know, I'm, tr I'm trying to think of like my record collection or who fascinated me. Um, yeah, I can't right now at the moment. I'm, I can't really, I can't really think of it, but um, who's the guy that produced the flaming lips? Is that guy named Dave Friedman or something? That sounds familiar. Dave Friedman actually does sound really familiar. Um, probably like to work with him. You know, there's a lot of people, but like as I said, a lot of a lot of them are, are out outside our budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We're not on Hollywood Records anymore. <laughs> well, Miles, I know you're a busy man. I'm gonna let Danny ask the final question to you, if okay, because uh, I know she had like a hundred lined up. But uh, Danny, send it <laughs> send it away on a high note. What what you got for him? Um, my my last question actually is um. If you have time, would you want to play a song for us really fast? I know you have a solo record. Oh, uh, yeah. I don't really want to play a song if that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> but when but, uh, when can we catch the show? I know you uh, earlier plugged uh, oh, Tuesdays. It's, Tues it's Tuesday. So not next Tuesday I'm doing a Zoom show for the people that bought tickets. But the week after that, it's every Tuesday at 7 Central. Yes. On Facebook. Miles and slash Miles Zuniga loves you is my handle, or if you just search for me, you'll you'll find my page, and uh, or you can go to YouTube and watch it on the Fastball YouTube channel. And um, I want to thank you guys for asking such great questions. Most people don't ever ask questions that good, so. Well, I we're very, I appreciate that. very thankful that you uh, you came on and, and gave us your time this evening. Yeah, we, we really appreciate it. It's my pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. Miles the nigga of Fastball. Give me a hell yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Have a fantastic rest of your day and uh, stay safe out there. Cheers. We appreciate it. All right. <laughs>